Um, it's my sincere pleasure to welcome you to the CSU Global Biodiversity Summit. This is the inaugural summit at CSU on Biodiversity. So my name is Chris Funk, and I'm the director of the CSU Global Biodiversity Center, what we call the GBC. And the GBC is hosted and housed underneath the School of Global Environmental Sustainability, what we call SOGIS. Um, the GBC's mission is to advance understanding, conservation, and appreciation of biodiversity. And what we defined as all of life's variation, ranging from genes and organisms to ecosystems and their interactions. And we advance this mission through four main pillars, which are research, policy advancement, education, and outreach. So you may not know it, but CSU is truly a, a global powerhouse of biodiversity research. Um, especially applied biodiversity research that feeds directly into management and um, policy. So as an example of this, CSU was ranked in the top 10 globally in the category of biodiversity conservation. And this is by the Center for World University Rankings. And this is one of three areas that CSU is recognized by this particular ranking system. And really hundreds of CSU faculty, postdocs, and graduate students and undergraduates are conducting biodiversity research around the world. Since biodiversity research is really spread around campus in different colleges and different departments, our goal at the GBC is to serve as a, a central node that connects these researchers to each other so that they can build the truly interdisciplinary teams spanning across colleges that you really need to solve these complex biodiversity problems. And another goal of the GBC is to connect uh, uh, CSU's expertise in biodiversity research to the external world, um, international, for example, policy platforms that could really benefit from our expertise. So to advance this goals, we do a lot of different things. We've hosted a number of panels and workshops on and off campus to train uh, researchers how to communicate with policymakers and to raise awareness about the complex issues surrounding biodiversity. We also collaborate with an organization known as Future Earth, which is an international sustainability research initiative to fund interdisciplinary research teams that tackle really important questions uh, we need to answer to address these complex biodiversity issues. And this is through our Pegasus granting program, which is funded by um, the Moore Foundation and the Nomis Foundation. So our Global Biodiversity Summit, which started yesterday, was kicked off yesterday with a keynote by uh, Sanjin from Conservation International, and extending it today with panels, another keynote, and a, uh, a, a movie tonight, which I'll talk about later is our, really our official announcement to CSU, the Four Cons community, the Front Range and beyond about the extraordinary work that people are doing right here uh, on biodiversity uh, around the globe. I'm particularly going to be exploring two really fundamental questions about biodiversity today. Um, first of all, why do we need biodiversity in the 21st century? And that's going to be the topic of our, our first panel right now and then at 11 we're going to have a second panel on how can we go from awareness of the threats to biodiversity to action to reverse these threats so i have a lot of people to thank for helping us uh, fund our summit um, including the college of business college of natural resources liberal arts natural sciences vet med and biomedical sciences also the departments of biology and fish wildlife and conservation biology the Office of International Programs, and Whole Foods for their financial support. And I also want to thank Jacob Job, uh, Kristen Pintad, I don't know if she's here, uh, Laura Shaver, and Joel Berger, who have put in a lot of time and energy to uh, pulling this off. So before I introduce our panelists, uh, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Rick Miranda, our provost and executive vice president of CSU, who's graciously made time in his very busy schedule, especially this week with homecoming, to welcome you as well. I don't have my football jersey on. I don't think they're going to let me play in the game anyway this weekend. So. Well, it's a great pleasure to honor to welcome you here today to CSU for this GBC summit. Uh, you know, I don't have to tell the people in this room how uh, 
important biodiversity is to our people, our communities, our ecosystems, and our planet. From clean water to healthy food to our internal and external microbiome systems, carbon capture issues, purity of our air quality, and on and on. Biodiversity is one of those kind of existential elements that truly sustain life on Earth and in ways that we uh, clearly perceive but continue to strive to understand. Um, we're happy. We're, we're happy about our abilities here at CSU to contribute to the local and national and global efforts in biodiversity research and engagement. And we have, as Chris mentioned, an excellent breadth of faculty, staff, and students thinking deeply about these issues. And we have administrative plans in place too, our clean energy plan, our accomplishments in sustainability, as evidenced by our first in the world platinum status and the stars rankings, our management of the campus generally. Yeah, we're happy about these things, but we're not satisfied. Um, we know that the power of research and the example of our campus policies can be extended far beyond CSU. And that's one of the goals of the GBC and one of the goals of this summit, too, to try and understand how biodiversity affects all of us and to disseminate that understanding far beyond the borders of our campus to see how we can take the knowledge that we're gaining both here and elsewhere and move it to concrete action. We can make a difference. We are making a difference, but only if we're effectively armed with the tools to do so and the will, the encouragement, and the resources to excite a broader impact with our fellow citizens. We must make this work, uh, as Chris mentioned to me a week or so ago, obtainable, approachable, feasible for our colleagues everywhere to uh, roll up their sleeves and use. Use our research and our policies and our examples to go to the next level of impact. We can, and we will, and this summit, I think, will help us do that. It's fall. The colors are changing. Homecoming weekend, as we mentioned, is just upon us. And we see right outside the window the cycle of life, uh, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, <laughs> evidence all, in evidence all around us. It's an appropriate moment, I think, to reflect on these issues. So life in the macro sense right now here is going into an annual season of dormancy. And it's time to re reflect and renew our commitment and resolve to redouble our efforts in these matters. I was running this morning. Uh, I go running every other day or so and around the neighborhood. We're blessed in Fort Collins with having a great set of running trails with uh, near water and, and creeks and ditches. And, and there's a lot of life out there. And I was running around and I ran into um, one of our great researchers here, uh, Jill Barron, who works with the USGS, an affiliate faculty member here, a member of our community for decades, and she was out walking the dog. So, uh, and so we chatted for a little while. I, I congratulated her on a recent um, award that they've been winning on, on her work in nitrogen uh, capture and, and uh, measurement, uh, very much uh, uh, spearheaded by her and, and uh, student projects. And uh, so we chatted for a little bit and, and I was reminded and I, I was thinking a little bit on my run about this summit today and what remarks I might make. And, and all of a sudden the dogs that she was, she was walking her dogs and they're kind of frisky little things. And, and all of a sudden they, and Jill is not a very large person. So all of a sudden the dogs kind of leaped in one direction, <laughs> took Jill away from me <laughs> in our conversation briefly as she struggled to rein him in. And what happened was that there was a rabbit stuck in, uh, in uh, uh, a little copse of, of uh, vegeta uh, you know, vegetation there, so little bushes. And it sort of triggered my mind, okay, there's a little, a little, bi a little bit of, of biodiversity happening right in front of me at 5.30 in the morning uh, between me and Jill and the dogs and the trees and the bushes and the rabbits. And <laughs> it, all it all comes together now. Those are kind of organismal levels of biodiversity. So we know that there are microscopic levels of biodiversity that are just so important to us and macroscopic levels of biodiversity with our atmosphere and our water systems and our oceans. And, 
And so this issue spans the, uh, the gamut from the small to the large and from the local to the global. And, and there's hardly anything more important that we can, uh, we can roll up our sleeves and make some progress on. So thanks very much for coming today. Thanks for your attention. Hope you have a great day. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much, Rick. Those are, uh, those are wonderful welcome and introduction to our panel. So um, if I could have our uh, four expert panelists come up right now, that'd be great. So uh, while they're coming up, let me tell you a little bit of how this is going to work today. Um, I'm going to give a little introduction to our expert panelists on this topic. And then they're going to have an opportunity to give a little summary on their opinion of this big question of why do we need biodiversity in the 21st century. And then we're going to open it up to Q&A to all of you. Um, you're welcome to come around closer if you'd like. And uh, this is your opportunity to ask whatever your pressing questions are about biodiversity um, and have them answered by people who have thought about this for a long time. Um, so with that, let me, uh, well, I'll wait a second for people to uh, get their water out of their bag or whatever. <laughs> this is kind of a pain to have up here, but I'm going to move it. When you're done, I will. Excellent. Um, so I'd like to uh, introduce our four expert panelists who uh, come from different perspectives on this big question of why do we need biodiversity in the 21st century. So first off, we have uh, Ed Barbier. Dr. Barbier is a professor in the Department of Economics at CSU, um, recently just started here at CSU this August. We're very happy to have him. And he's also a senior scholar in the School of Global Environmental Sustainability, so just that um, in which the GBC is, is nested. His main expertise is natural resource and development economics, as well as the interface between economics and ecology. He served as a consultant policy analyst for a, a tremendous variety of uh, national, international, and non-governmental agencies, including the UN, the World Bank, and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, he's consistently ranked among the top 12 cited environmental economists in the world. And Barrier was elected a 2015 fellow of the Association of Environmental and Resource uh, Economists. So welcome. Um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Joanna Krauss. She is a research ecologist at the US Geological Survey. Um, one of the great things about CSU isn't just its diversity and breadth of biodiversity researchers here uh, physically at CSU, but all the associated federal and state agencies that also uh, deal with research on biodiversity. So this is a, a big part of how we're trying to network with the GBC with, with these agencies. And so we're really happy to have uh, Dr. Krause here today. Um, she studies the effects of man-made and natural stressors on aquatic ecosystems and linkages to terrestrial food webs. She received her PhD at the University of Virginia and has received fellowships from NSF, the Japan Society for uh, the Promotion of Science, and the U.S. Geological Survey as a um, very prestigious Mendenhall Fellow to conduct her, her research locally as well as abroad. And her work is really used extensively by land management and regulatory agencies to help assess the efficiency of management actions regarding our natural resources. So welcome here. Um, next we have uh, Dr. Tom Dean. <coughs> Dr. Dean serves as the Kimball Family uh, Faculty Fellow and Professor of Entrepreneurship and Sustainable Enterprise at CSU. He's in the College of Business. His research focuses on understanding business strategies and economic opportunities um, as they, uh, th those opportunities that, how they're present in emerging social and environmental trends. Um, he's authored uh, a course, a rigorous theoretical examination, and textbook on environmental and sustainable entrepreneurship. And so he's really an, a pioneer in this field of 
using business as a tool for conserving biodiversity rather than how it's traditionally perceived as an antagonist to biodiversity. And finally, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Colleen Duncan. Dr. Duncan is an associate professor in the College of Vet Medicine and Biomedical Sciences, and she's also a member of the CSU One Health Initiative. Um, her research involves the use of pathology to investigate herd level dynamics in both domestic and wild animals. And she's particularly interested in understanding the cumulative effects of multiple stressors on the health of wild populations. And she does some pretty cool research uh, on things like disease ecology of northern fur seals, polar bear health, and skin cancer in horses. All right, so uh, please join me in welcoming our uh, panelists. And so uh, next I'm gonna give each of these uh, distinguished experts a chance to talk about their overall opinion on this issue of why we need biodiversity in the 21st century. Okay. Um. Oh, it should be on. Yeah, okay, great. Um, well, thanks, Chris, for inviting me to be part of the uh, Global Biodiversity Summit. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's also a pleasure to be at Colorado State University and uh, to be part of both the Department of Economics and uh, the School of Global Environmental Sustainability. And I want to thank Rick Miranda, Provost of the University, for making that happen. So, uh, absolutely delighted. Um, now, what economists like myself have learned from natural scientists is that uh, biodiversity, the, the variety of life within ecosystems, um, is the invisible glue that allows these uh, precious systems to provide us with a variety of really beneficial goods and services, uh, which are now called uh, ecosystem services. So in a nutshell, what greater biodiversity allows is healthier functioning of ecosystems and natural habitats, which in turn give human beings uh, a lot of support and valuable benefits um, that we can't uh, really do much without. Um, so for example, uh, in terrestrial systems, biodiversity uh, fulfills important functions such as pollination, pest control, nutrient cycling, and carbon sequestration, all of which are very valuable services we're finding out. In marine environments, uh, which are oceans, estuaries, and coasts, um, biodiversity supports uh, recreational and commercial fish harvests, uh, reduces pollution discharge uh, from inland, and also um, promotes healthy habitats that are quite essential, such as coral reefs, coastal wetlands, uh, and other important uh, systems. In our freshwater, we, we, we often don't look at our freshwater and see it as a, a, a mainstay of biodiversity, but, but there, the variety of life supports recreational, commercial um, fishing as well. It absorbs a lot of waterborne pollution, keeps uh, our water and water supplies clean and healthy, and of course there's recreational use, as I mentioned. Um, another aspect of uh, biodiversity is the is the way it 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 it, it helps um, natural systems recover from shocks, uh, from damaging <coughs> hazards and events, whether it's coastal storms or whether it's flood or droughts. The healthier um, the natural life within a system, the healthier the system is, and the more it's able to resist these sort of things. Um, so in a nutshell, the, we have found um, uh, working, uh, economists have found working with natural scientists, there's a variety of ways in which uh, biodiversity ends up benefiting human beings. And I just want to uh, mention a few examples from my own studies. Uh, earlier this year, a uh, publication in Science Advances, uh, myself and some colleagues showed that in prairie grasslands, the more plant species there are, there's more carbon storage, not only in the uh, vegetation, but in the soils that, uh, that retain. Uh, and we found that, that um, going from one to 10 species had twice as much carbon storage value than just going from one to two species. Uh, and this has tremendous implications for things like conservation reserve programs, because rather than just preserving all, all prairie grassland, you want to preserve those that have species richness because you're going to get more carbon storage value, plus a whole range of other environmental benefits. We also found that agriculture can benefit from biological pest control. So for example, 
a study some colleagues and I published in Ecological Economics a couple years ago. Uh, we looked particularly at how um, uh, natural predators reduces uh, pests in key crops like uh, uh, squash and broccoli. And we, we looked at only two states in the United States where this occurred, and we still found that th the benefits of this biological control through a more diverse set of predators actually saved society between 1.5 and 12 million dollars per year, depending on the scenario. And that's only a fraction of these crop production across the United States, that's just two states, and, and there's probably um, uh, many more values. Look at California, where uh, vegetable crops are incredibly important. And then um, my other work uh, uh, has looked at uh, the healthy uh, ecosystems uh, in the coast, such as um, uh, mangroves in Southeast Asia and salt marsh in Southeast Louisiana. Um, I like working in Southeast regions. You know. And uh, uh, basically what we found is that the healthier and the more diverse the mangroves and the salt marshes are, the more storm protection you have. The better you have uh, protection of from uh, storm damages to property and livelihoods. Uh, and we also found, of course, that um, these habitats are important uh, in terms of nursery and breeding grounds for offshore commercial fisheries. So local people also benefit from the diversity leading to more breeding and nursery grounds and then more support. So if biodiversity is so valuable, why is it disappearing? Why are we having a trouble? Well, um, uh, economists like myself believe it's down to <coughs> to the three I's, um, invisibility, incentives, and institutions. On the invisibility side, I mentioned it right at the beginning, biodiversity is the invisible glue. And the problem is because it's invisible, it's hard to see, it's hard to trace out what increases species richness and variety of life does to support ecosystems, which then leads to the goods and services that benefit us. It's hard to make that trace all the way through. The analogy is how do you uh, 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 look at a, a car and which component of your engine uh, would you take out uh, or, or you would add in order to make the car run and function. We don't think about it. We just want the car to get us from A to B and we value that, but how the car works and how it uh, supports and the different things in it that lead us to have a engine, healthy engine to get us from A to B is something we don't normally think about. Same problem with, with biodiversity. Um, it's the hidden value that's hard to, to discover, and that's what, as economists, we work on with, with natural scientists. The incentives don't favor conservation either. Most of the biodiversity that's remaining is occurring in tropical regions, and the tropical regions uh, are, are, um, have uh, many low- and middle-income countries that are developing fast, and as a result, um, with the development, uh, they are uh, um, changing their habitats, uh, deforestation is rife, uh, and, and also exploitation of natural environments uh, continues. This is just a process of development that unless you demonstrate that the loss of biodiversity in the long run is detrimental to the welfare of these countries, it's hard to convince them on their own that it's worth foregoing development uh, to preserve them. Yet we as uh, the world benefits from that biodiversity. So the incentive's got to be somehow to find the mechanism by which we, all of us, help developing countries um, uh, uh, conserve um, more biodiversity that's in their interests and our interests uh, both now and in the long run. And that leads to institutions, the third eye. At the moment, we don't have adequate institutions to do exactly that, to provide the incentives. We have yet to come up with a reasonable biodiversity agreement that parallels, let's say, the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, where there are agreed targets that countries should pursue to conserve biodiversity and that uh, both countries and the international community works together to ensure those targets take place. Nor do we have adequate funding mechanisms such as the Climate Adaptation Fund that is climate change. We don't have the similar thing with biodiversity to, to help developing countries, those that, countries that are poor but have the world's remaining biodiversity, um, uh, help them to, to make the transition to conserve more biodiversity. And those are the type of institutions we need to think about and develop as we move forward. And I'll be happy to talk more about them later. Thanks. All right. Uh, hi. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for inviting me. I'm Joanna Krauss and a research ecologist at the USGS Fort Collins Science Center, which is located just south, just south of campus. 
Um, I was asked to give my position on why we need biodiversity in the 21st century, specifically from the perspective of water. And since I'm a government scientist, I'm actually going to tweak this question a little bit to align it with one of the goals of the USGS, uh, which is to provide unbiased science in support of management of our natural resources. So I'm going to flip the question to ask, is biodiversity needed for effective management of our natural resources? And might biodiversity be a natural resource in and of itself? Since we're talking about biodiversity and I'm here to represent water, I'm going to focus my comments on biological resources associated with water, uh, specifically fish. The definition of biodiversity I'm going to apply here uh, is similar to what was mentioned earlier in the promo video. So that's the variability among living organisms, including diversity within species, between species, and of ecosystems. And I'll also admit right now that I actually don't study biodiversity directly. So for example, I don't ask, does the variability of this system, for example, make it more productive? Instead, I ask, how many and much of these organisms are in a specific location? And what are the interactions among the organisms and between those organisms and their environment that um, explain these patterns of um, abundance and distribution on the landscape? So how does this approach help me address if biodiversity is needed for effective management of natural resources? I was hired at the USGS um, about six years ago to study mountain streams in the Colorado Mineral Belt, which is just uh, southwest of here. It's a band of, um, it's an area where you can see a lot of evidence of historic mining. Um, if you drive along I-70, you see those mine tailings. Um, so, so people in the state and the management agencies here are naturally interested in the fish populations in the streams that I was working in, as fishing brings at least $1.3 million in annually to the state and supports 14,000 jobs. However, the fish do not exist on their own. They rely on insects, plants, microbes, um, and sometimes other fish for food. Thus, we can't just look at how fish are impacted by changes in the environment. We have to look at how their food uh, are affected by these changes as well. And one of the questions I asked as part of the, this, the work that I've done here was how do heavy metal concentrations in the streams due to those, that historical mining activity and acid rock drainage, um, natural, natural weathering, uh, impact the diets of stream trout? So what we found, and we've, we've published these results in Journal of Applied Ecology and um, Ecological Applications, was that the fish eat mainly aquatic instruct, insects in clean streams. So in clean streams, about 90% of their diet by mass is coming from aquatic insects. But as the metal levels rise, they switch to terrestrial insects. So in um, moderately impacted streams, over 50% of their diet are coming from terrestrial insects. So in this example, the trout populations and biomass were sustained in moderately impacted streams by ants and beetles rather than by mayflies, caddisflies, doneflies, and aquatic midges. This occurred because aquatic insects are more sensitive in general uh, to changes in metal levels than the trout living in those streams. So in this case, having a diverse available uh, food base allows for the diet shift that maintain these trout populations. Uh, another example of how I found biodiversity may affect management of natural resources, as well as potentially be viewed as a resource in and of itself, comes from an Idaho wa a watershed that contains uh, spawning Pacific salmon and also supports subsistence fishing by a member of the Ness Pierce tribe. In that case, I'm studying how the chemistry of, uh, I'm studying the chemistry of food webs supporting the local fish in, in this watershed uh, that received runoff from historic mercury mining in an area that's slated to be redeveloped again for mining activity. So the number and types of connections between the fish and their food uh, in this system are likely to influence the dynamics of mercury bioaccumulation, um, which can impact the top predators, including humans in this case. These connections also impact how much mercury makes it to land and to terrestrial consumers such as birds and bats uh, in adult aquatic insects. So if you think of mayflies that live in the water as larvae, they come off the water as adults. You see those flying around streams. So those can actually be like little packets of, of certain contaminants like mercury and PCBs bringing them to terrestrial uh, consumers. So the Nest Pierce, they value information about these food web connections as well as about the health of the ecosystem itself. In other words, having an intact ecosystem 
thus maintaining some of the variety of connections that evolved in a region may be a priority in and of itself uh, to be maintained. So in conclusion, these examples and many others involving biological, cultural, and aesthetic values that we place on nature illustrate uh, one way that biodiversity might affect our natural resources as well as be considered a, a natural resource to be managed. Um, so thanks. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, audience, for, for being here. Um, I'm from the business school, so sometimes uh, among scientists and others who look more deeply uh, about this, I feel a little uninformed, maybe even like a fish out of water. Um, <laughs> but, you know, as we know, fish can grow legs and lugs as well. So I'm the guy in the business school that tries to understand how businesses can be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And so my perspective is as we move forward in these challenges of biodiversity and climate change, and there's no better efficient and often more effective actor than businesses and more specifically the process of entrepreneurship. So I get really excited about some of the things that are happening um, and how the world is changing. So if I, if I um, had to if I made a map of population over time, and it was in this room, I'd have to walk from way over there in the population since the year zero or something like that on the Earth would just be flat for a long period of time. And I have to get way over to that side of the room and finally it would just go boom like this. And so I wonder, you know, what does that mean? And oftentimes we say, well, this is terrible, we have too much population. But another way to look at it is, Actually, this is such a testament to the su success of the human species and the economic institutions that we've created over time to make that happen. The productivity of our agriculture, the innovation of our medicine, the um, incredible transportation and communication that we now have is unparalleled, of course, in, the, in human history. That, to me, as an entrepreneurship professor, is a function of this process of entrepreneurship, as well as the institutions that incent, going back to N, entrepreneurship. So um, Bill Baumol, famous economist, wrote a book called Entrepreneurship Productive, uh, Unproductive, and Destructive. And he basically pointed out the fact that the supply of people pursuing profit, pursuing economic return, doesn't vary that much over time. What varies is what they're rewarded for doing. So think back to sort of the age of the Vikings, right? Coming into um, <coughs> the British Isles and raping and pillaging, and that was a very profitable activity at the time, right? So what do you would expect? You expect more Vikings, right? So if we look at modern times, what are we incenting? What is the economic system driving towards? I would argue that we have never been at a point at which entrepreneurship is more aligned on most dimensions with good social and economic outcomes. The, our entrepreneurs of today are incredible at creating new things from internet and all these other things. But that's not to say it's all good, right? So what we know is the process of entrepreneurship and capitalism is at the same time unparalleled in the course of human history it's also eating away at the fundamental ecological resources that is needed for business and society to survive. So how does that begin, how do we begin to change that? How do we, how do our institutions catch up to this, you know, sort of immediate spike in population? So most people sort of see sort of economic parameters as fixed, right? Like, oh, well, this is the way the world works and we're just going to play within that world. But what we know from research of Nobel laureates um, uh, like Robert Thomas is that over time, institutions change. So what institutions are needed in this modern world of uh, decreasing biodiversity, climate change issues, all these things, what new institutions need to develop that will motivate entrepreneurs to change um, their behaviors. And more interesting is, what's the role of entrepreneurs 
in changing those institutions through their own actions. Um, just as some examples, I, I think we, in the last 10 years, the success in some of these areas has been phenomenal. Uh, and I'm not Pollyannish because I understand the nature of how far we need to go. But in 10 years, solar photovoltaics went from 5 gigawatts of annual capacity to 227. In 10 years, um, the installed capacity of wind power went from 60 gigawatts to 433 gigawatts. We've seen the development of green building. Um, I just read an article, I think it was in the New York Times, China has announced they are going to be um, um, making um, uh, internal combustion engine cars illegal and it will all be electric cars. California is thinking about following suits. What's the response? China's an important market. GM comes out and says, we're going to have 20 electric vehicle models by, I forget what the year is, 2023 or something like that. Ford comes out, we're going to have 14 electric vehicle models by about the same time. And so we see the other one that I'm really excited about is natural organic foods, right? So we've seen those markets grow. Um, so I did, um, I did a speech a little while ago talking about Tom's top 10 eco-institutional convergences, which is what are the institutions that are developing today and that have changed the economic incentive systems or, or are beginning to change the economic incentive systems. And I'm just going to read them to you. I only have five minutes, so I won't go, go deep into it, I promise, Chris. <laughs> um, consumer preferences are changing, things like organic foods. The Pope released the encyclical. And when you change things at the top, as Dana Meadows said, uh, you need to change things in the what people believe. And when the Pope comes out with an encyclical about climate change and its effects on poverty and distribution of wealth and the ability to support, that's a change in perspective that influences many, many people. Secure property rights, right? Are we moving towards more secure property rights for land and water and things like that? In some sense, we are. Certification systems like organic and green building have transformed markets and given them traction and given entrepreneurs a way to communicate that being green and that, that their greenness is superior to consumers. Um, benefit corporations, we were talking about this earlier. Um, benefit corporation is a legal form of organization that requires that um, corporation to pursue not just financial benefits for shareholders, but also social and environmental consideration. Absolutely transformative. So much so that Danone just bought White Wave, which is a company that was started in Colorado, was bought by Dean Foods, spun out as an IPO, and recently purchased by Danone for $10 million. Huge success story. Well, Danone said, we're going to form White Wave as a public benefit corporation affiliated with Danone. It's going to be called Danone Wave. This is absolutely transformative. Renewable portfolio standards and feed-in tariffs, public investment in green tech in China and the United States, the process of crowdfunding that enables you to maybe capture public goods, clean tech venture capital, impact investing, and lastly, carbon caps, taxes, and trading. So I think we have a lot to be optimistic about. And I think we need to be optimistic. We need a little dose of optimism sometime in the face of, of a lot of bad news on a lot of fronts. And so, but I think in the end, the key is how do we create these incentives that drive the power of entrepreneurs and we can capture the power of entrepreneurship to build a more sustainable and biodiverse world. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, hi there, thanks everybody for coming. And um, as a veterinarian and um, member of the School of Public Health here at CSU, I'm, I'm pretty stoked that health made it to the table. I also thought it was really interesting that both in the introductory video and in the introduction of some of the panelists, people use the term health. And the reason is, is health is all around us and health impacts all of us. Therefore, I think the ability to link some of these issues around biodiversity and health is really, is really important. 
Um, unfortunately, however, a lot of people in the health field come from the sciences. And scientists are, in general, pretty lousy communicators, pretty lousy at dealing with uncertainty, and pretty lousy at dealing with complex systems. This is particularly true in the biomedical sciences, where people want, like, child has fever, fever is due to bacteria, control bacteria, control fever, send child outdoor. We tend to have a very narrow focus on the types of health issues that we work on and our solutions. Um, so if you think about the complexity within biodiversity and then how that relates to health, um, there's, there's an unfortunate disconnect there. But lucky for you, I'm the simplest person on this panel and I'm going to make this dead easy for you. There are two ways to look at improving health outcomes. The first one is more of a reactive. So that is coming up with a treatment, coming up with a cure for something. And that's really sexy. It's really easy to get people behind finding a cure for something. Some dude in tight, short, tight shorts and a good bike and a lot of drugs gave us the yellow band to cure testicular cancer. Um, and that rallied a lot of support, right? Um, so when you think about biodiversity and how this fits with sort of that proactive or therapeutic area, there are undoubtedly not just thousands but millions, tens of millions of potential biomedical innovations out there in the world right now that are completely untapped. A large part of that is probably medicinal. The number of biomedical innovations that come from the natural world is unprecedented in science. And there is so much out there that nobody has discovered. So that is a huge area and a huge argument for the relationship between maintaining biodiversity and health. And that's really important, but I would argue that more important than that is actually the proactive linkages between health and biodiversity. So in public health, we talk about um, the determinants of health. And these are factors that individuals or populations need to have to keep themselves healthy. And those are not just what you're born with or what your parents gave to you, but those are overwhelmingly more related to how you choose to live your life and the environment in which you live. So these are not just physical, like the air we breathe and the food we eat, but they're also social and they're economic. Um, and these are huge. This is often referred to as life course epidemiology. It's probably more important what you eat and drink every single day and the air that you breathe than the drug you get when you finally get some terrible condition. Unfortunately, public health has always had trouble making that appeal to the general public. So while Lance Armstrong certainly blinged up those yellow bands, where is the poop brown band for global diarrhea? Nobody got behind that movement. And that's because prevention is not sexy. Prevention is really challenging and prevention is really complicated. Unfortunately, when it comes to um, the ecosystem services that are most important for promoting health, which is the air we breathe, the food we eat, and the water we drink, um, there is the same type of challenge in engaging people and how that relates to their own health. So we learned last night about the importance of sharing a personal story with respect to connecting with people. I will tell you that a few years ago when I first started doing polar bear work, it was quite literally Earth Day when I hugged my first wild polar bear after I had darted it out of a helicopter, which was pretty epic already. Um, and I swore that day that I would do whatever it took to commit to um, reducing my carbon footprint and helping keep this habitat that polar bears need to survive. So I went home and I bought my electric car, first of two, um, and I, I definitely changed behaviors. But I get why the polar bear is a lousy icon for climate change. Probably only two other people here may touch wild polar bears in their lifetime, if even. So that's a really hard thing to get people to connect to. But you know what? Everybody wants to be healthy. And there are things that we can do all the time to connect these linkages between biodiversity, health promotion, and natural resources. And that's what we really need to do. But in order to do that, we need people to help change both the system of the scientists who study health, but also the way we capture and associate health impacts with um, exposures. So for example, I went for a run this morning. I took my dogs, associating with animals is health promoting. I went outside. I went to a natural area. But then I also pulled this stick out of one of their tails and I got a splinter and this may become an abscess. But when I go to the hospital to get this lanced, um, they will only write down foreign body abscess. They won't write down, hey, that chick ran 5K with her dogs and got some fresh air this morning, and that is health promoting. <laughs> so we have this huge disconnect, and we need everybody in this room, everybody on this panel, to start thinking about health in the context of um, the system in which we live. That's all I got.
Thank you all. That was, that was excellent. Really appreciate that. Um, so now is the interactive part of the panel where you guys get involved. And um, so what we're going to do is we have uh, a couple of folks with microphones. Uh, Jacob has a mic over there. Okay, uh, JC has a mic over here. So just raise your hand and uh, ask away. And oh, one thing is, uh, let us know who you're directing your question to. Or you could say to the whole panel, and like, anyone could choose to try to answer it. Um, hello, I'm Wendy. I'd like to direct this to the panel and everyone in the room, because I think we might be missing the boat by pushing biodiversity, because the definition is the number of species in an area. We have a lot of invasive species. Maybe some of the cities actually have more biodiversity because of all the tropical plants, uh, and, um, exotic species that are brought into areas. So somehow we have to be connecting that to natural systems and ecosystem functioning, and not just the number of species. There are more species in garden plots than in some uh, natural systems, just because they're species that have been brought in doesn't necessarily mean that that is what we're looking for. So I'd like to hear other people's thoughts on that. I'll just take a short start to it because I love that question and I actually thought about this a lot when I was preparing my comments. So where we live right now is high desert. <laughs> the actual species diversity here is low compared to other areas of the country like the southeast. Um, and so I think for me part of the answer to this question is biodiversity is a slippery tricky term because it is a commonly used buzzword. Um, and so it's important that we define what we're talking about and that we also understand what our endpoints are that we're interested in uh, obtaining. And so from my point of view, <clears throat> you know, talking about this sort of providing science for management perspective, it's important to work with managers to understand what the endpoints are and to also understand that part of their, what they're managing may be, you know, mineral extraction or maybe, you know, timber extraction or, you know, something, food production, you know, there's plenty of, kind of competing, uh, competing goals that may be going on in the same area. And, you know, um, but there is a lot of work done, at least down, you know, in the Fort Collins Science Center where I'm located on invasive species in particular. And I can tell you that there is a lot of money put towards, you know, controlling invasives, at least at the government, uh, at the government level, um, because of the threats that it, it that those pose for native, native uh, animals and plants. Um, so I don't think I really answered your question, but I just wanted to say I think it was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I also, uh, thank you very much. It's an excellent question. Uh, the issue of invasive, invasive species or what type of species we want is, is a critical one. Um, I've, I actually worked uh, on a study with some ecologists and economists on uh, the impact of the horticultural industry in North America on an, the introduction of exotic species, some of which become invasive species. And that distinction is incredibly important. Because in your own example, uh, gardening, uh, people have a lot of exotic species. Not all those exotic species, which are often on sale by the horticultural industry, you know, garden centers and so forth, not all those species that people buy that are in their gardens end up in the wider environment and end up being successfully established and become invasives. But those that do can cause a lot of damage. And the question really is one of trade-offs, which is where economics comes in. Do you have the profits and the benefits to people of, of having wonderful gardens in their hose, here in Fort Collins and elsewhere? Uh, that's beneficial to, to <coughs> some members of society um, to have a thriving horticulture industry plus having people enjoy uh, house gardens uh, and stuff. But on the other hand, there's the risk that one of those plants may get into the wider environment and cause a lot of significant environmental damage to species, uh, to, sorry, to ecosystems that didn't have those species before. 
And, uh, and so uh, there what we find is that the invasive species comes in and outcompetes or it changes the habitat, and that causes damages. So I want to speak very careful uh, uh, exactly. It's not all, um, all variety of species that matters, and you shouldn't preserve all species richness, but you should be careful what the trade-offs are, what the benefits and costs are. But getting to another aspect of it, um, it's also, as I pointed out in my talk, at the beginning, it's really hard to look at an ecosystem and to see if you increase the species richness of that ecosystem, what do you get out at the end in terms of benefits? That's hard to do, but we're starting to get better handle on that because we're starting to trace out um, what does it mean uh, to have uh, increased species in terms of carbon storage, in terms of better habitat for breeding, for uh, healthier ecosystems, for protection. And, and those things we can value, but it's a long process and we have to do more of that to figure out what is the value of having more species or less. Thank you. I'll, I'll offer a couple other examples that sort of um, illustrate that. Um, so in the 1600s, honeybees were brought over to North America. So if you look at the ecosystem services, I mean, clearly we're not getting rid, rid of honeybees, right? So you have to look at those as an exotic. Um, and, and no one's calling them invasive necessarily, except for the people who really care about the impacts to native bees. But that's a, a real quandary, right? Is, is what do you do about those things? Look at feral hogs. I mean, it, most of the states that now have feral hogs also brought over in the 1600s. Um, while lots of them like the revenue from hunting, they cause a lot of damage. So now states are certainly getting on board for the removal of feral hogs in a more aggressive way. But to bring it back to the front range, moose. Moose in our beloved Rocky Mountain National Park are considered an exotic species. But because of our values that are so differing amongst exotics, invasives, natives, you don't see Rocky Mountain National Park staff removing moose from the park. So just a couple examples that are really, uh, you know, put this, this whole, uh, quandary about exotics and invasives and natives into some other perspectives that are worth thinking about. Thanks. Thank you all. Um, this one is directed towards Dr. Colleen Duncan. Uh, my name is Alyssa Breda. I'm an undergraduate here. Um, and so I wanted to ask, um, how, do you how do you begin to promote a sustainable or uh, promote sustainability or conservation um, for medicinal exploration um, with pertaining to biodiversity? For example, how do you make this idea a no-brainer to people? And um, do you talk about you know examples that we've already made and many um, advances in medicine based off of natural um, products medicinally that have you know promoted cures or gone a long way in the health community? Um, and does this does funding play a role? And also, do how do pharmaceutical companies play a role in this? Because I know they have a lot of power. Um. Definitely. So it, it's a great question. And, and honestly, you've kind of got the answer already. So I would say the number one thing in terms of uh, raising awareness is to make a connection between um, uh, individuals. And, and it really is, it's really at the individual level. You have to get people on board with why you're doing it and a potential outcome. So for example, um, there is, there's nobody in this world who hasn't been affected by some type of terrible disease. Cancer, Cancer people have done a great job with this. I look at animal cancer, and um, animal cancer funding comes largely from um, sort of spin-offs or relationships between human cancers. And the reason why people often choose to treat cancer in their own animals is because they already have a perception of this terrible disease based on an experience that they've had with some friend or family member. So I think the first most important step is to having, creating awareness in that this is not some obscure um, 
uh, treatment for some disease that these people are never going to see. It's never going to affect people's family or friends or anything like that. So um, I think that's the first most important step. And that's, that's really pretty easy. I mean, we can look to um, all kinds of commonly used um, therapeutics out there, even antibiotics. I mean, most of these come from our are effectively naturally occurring or started that way. So um, nobody is untouched by that. So I think the first step is to find a connection between individuals and how this may apply to them. So get that linkage. Um, in terms of big pharma, that's always an issue, right? At the end of the day, though, um, even if you, uh, and there are some great folks in pharma, but um, even if you look at it from the standpoint of pharma's only in it for money, there is actually an economic benefit to this as well, too, right? So um, for a lot of these synthetic compounds and synthetic um, uh, sort of complex therapeutics, there are costs, huge costs in many cases, both in R&D and also production and sustainability. So things that balance more within kind of a natural ecosystem are actually very valuable. So showing that value or having them realize that is, is big. Um, getting pharma on board with these types of um, treatments is, is really important as well. Um, but I would say the, the most, the, the key piece is really creating an awareness about how related this is. The thing that comes in the jar from the supermarket actually came from the world around you and creating that type of connectivity. Um, because it's people having a voice that actually will be heard by industry as well. And it's, that should never be underestimated, the power of sort of public voice and public persuasion um, within economic systems. That drives our economies. So I'm not sure if that totally answers it. But. Uh, can we ask the panelists to talk closer to the microphones, or you can remove them off of the stands as well if it makes it easier? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. We have a question back here. Uh, so, uh, I'm Joel Berger, and I have a question for the entire panel. Um, when I think back um, to the late, uh, to the late, uh, the final years of the 20th century, the state of California was considering how to move education forward. They still do that, of course. And one of the topics that was on the agenda for the K through 12 um, courses involved a new required course. And there was debate in whether it should be a course in economics or a course in environmental sciences. And I thought, wow, what a great opportunity to think forward and a lead by California. Well, as it turned out that they invoked a course in economics, and of course, based on what I hear from the panel and know that people on the panel see the world um, through the eyes of biological diversity, and it's important. But I'm not sure that that was the, the way that uh, choice was made. And so I guess my question for um, people on the panel are, what is it that you think we can do educationally at a level that is not just college students to help fuel the connect that, you, uh, that we're all focusing on? Go ahead, Tom. You should. Joel, that's a great question. Um, I think the big problem, uh, the big mistake California did is to perpetuate the myth that economy and environment are separate by doing that. That's a false choice, and it's a choice that, <clears throat> uh, looking to the future, we can't afford to make anymore as a society. Um, what this panel is saying, and what people in the audience are saying, is that uh, there should be a connectivity going on between um, what we get out in terms of economic benefits and costs, and what we do to the environment. And, um, and too much the, of, of the view of the world we have is to, is to create this disconnect. Um, but we also have to be careful because uh, um, it takes a long time to change institutions. And so uh, we, we, we have to start with education as well. But, but uh, uh, so I think it's great that, that, that California is thinking about the future and, and I'd like to see more states do that. But what I would like us to do is, is to, if we're gonna start changing institutions, which Tom was mentioning, uh, is incredibly important. It's a long-term process, and we need to start with our education and increasing public awareness of, of these connections between uh, the environment and economy, and, and biodiversity is one of the ways in which it's connected. So 
So I guess I'll add to that as well. Um, and I, I concur, it should have been a course that combined them both, uh, at least part of the economics course. Um, but you could probably, probably should have adopted both of the courses. Um, but the question is, how do we make, um, how do we make great capitalism, great environmentalism? And in my mind as well, how do we make great environmentalism, great capitalism? So how do we bring those together? How do we make the economic system serve everything we want it to serve? Uh, but the question of education is a really good one because when it comes to institutions, we look at the broad sort of general informal institutions that sit in what I call embeddedness. And that's the beliefs, the values, and, and Ed's exactly right. Those take a long time to change. But they're also rooted in exactly what you say, in the K through 12 system. That's where we're forming these values and understandings and knowledge. And it's really important to have that foundation across the entirety of society. So um, I agree, we, we need to do a better job at that level. And then that filters down to everything else that happens, I think, in society. Um, to some degree, there's a transformation in business schools. Uh, I, I have to say that business schools sometimes are very much part of the problem here. Um, and from the values we sometimes teach um, to, um, you know, what we say about the way systems work and not thinking more broadly and reflectively. Um, and that's true across, I think that's true across most of business schools within the United States. On the other hand, we're seeing tremendous change within those schools um, in speaking about some of these and trying, in, in trying to understand it. We have an MBA program focused on social and sustainable enterprise. Um, so if you want to move into, you, you know, I think the power, the business is very powerful, um, uh, really a, a source of change. Um, I'd invite you to check out our, our MBA program and if you're an undergrad right now and interested in how we use power of business to, to make some of that change. There are MBA programs that are, that are, that are doing that and uh, we have a really good one here at CSU. So, sorry about the plug, but we'd love to see you uh, in the classroom. And uh, I'll just say a couple words too, because I, uh, I, I heard part of the question was about sort of education outreach for people also under college age. And um, in my experience with that, uh, basically working and also volunteering with, with young people, what seems to connect with them the best are what people have said before is stories, you know? So doing these bio blasts or those kinds of nature interactions one-on-one -on -one with students and telling them things like, this dragonfly larvae breathes through its butt, you know? They love that stuff, you know? And it's true, <laughs> that's where the gills are. And so, um, and so the point is that I think that that one-on-one, -on -one, you know, get, you know, I mean, this is not new, uh, but that one-on-one -on -one get into nature, get dirty, but also, over time in my career, I think I've become more of a pragmatist because, you know, for example, in the, one of the surveys that we did with these young students, it was downstream of a dam. And all the ecological indicators suggested that the stream was in really good shape, actually. <laughs> you know, and I think in working in my current position, um, part of the idea of providing unbiased science is actually um, trying not to use impassioned language uh, illustrating a previous bias towards one outcome or the other. And I know that all scientists aim towards being unbiased, but there's just a particular sensitivity when you're working with multiple groups of people that, that you know, no one's gonna sit down at the table uh, with me if they feel that I already, you know, have it out against their activity. You know, they're there because they wanna do things in a better way. Um, and so I found personally that that's, that's been something that's come out of my career as well that I think can also benefit you know, educational opportunities with students to show them it's not a polarized world. We really have to work in this gray area throughout our whole lives and setting students up to be able to do that is I think gonna be crucial uh, moving forward. Thank you very much um, for your positions which are very enlightening. I would like to, to um, bring a topic uh, which I've been hearing discussions about for the last 30 years. Um, you know, I've been hearing how we're trying to get better at valuing and internalizing the costs of uh, biodiversity de degradation in cost-benefit analysis. I've been hearing 
social responsibility of business. Um, yet, uh, you know, what uh, I see today is the United States withdrawing from the Paris Agreement and just uh, today from UNESCO. So um, there's something to be talked about, uh, about you know, societies as a whole and as the, ab about the structural conditions that actually define what, that, what those societies can do within certain bounds with the idea of the power of one, okay? And that bounds your logic to ideas like, well, we're gonna consume ourselves out of degradation into sustainability. So my, uh, my question would be, um, when you think about the issue of metabolism, the issue of having a society that is based largely in its beliefs uh, in vigor, not in diversity, not in resilience today, unfortunately, but actually on the vigor of um, its capacity to produce, to grow. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that Dr. Barbier is probably um, very, very well versed into this discussion of, well, does, does, grow, does growing the economy really lead us uh, to the paths of, you know, being able to have happy societies um, and uh, global biodiversity? Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, that's a big question, Bernardo. Uh, Let's, let's step back a bit and just see what, what has hap changed in the last 30 years since you brought up the 30-year time horizon. One of the biggest advances, and this is something that's occurred uh, in, in thinking economically about the world and how we manage it, <clears throat> one of the biggest advances is, is to view nature and environment as a form of wealth. Um, that, uh, yes, we didn't create that wealth, but it's been endowed to us. And that wealth is incredibly diverse, incredibly important, and it encompasses um, not just fossil fuels and, and uh, other resources that we've been used, or, uh, or the use of the environment as a sink, but it encompasses all the richness of ecosystems and, and uh, ecological capital and the living organisms that make it up. And <clears throat> how we manage that is incredibly important, just like we manage any portfolio. Uh, of assets, and, and, and if you include that natural wealth along with capital wealth and human capital, uh, which is uh, our, our workforce and the skills involved in it, that's the foundation of our economies. And so, um, yeah, the federal governments sometimes don't get it. We have a good example that you brought up uh, of a government that's made a big mistake, our government, and withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. But look, uh, the advantages of, of, of a market-based democratic system like ours is that it's more decentralized, and there's actors at different levels. There's corporations, there's businesses, there's entrepreneurs, there's states, there's local governments. There's something called the, the Climate Alliance, for example. And um, uh, the, the Climate Alliance, including, including the state of Colorado, is, is dedicated to, to maintaining the Paris Accord. Um, uh, there's actions taken all the time at the corporate level to try and overcome some of these things. For, so, for example, World Resources Institute um, has made a list of, of, of corporations that have uh, pledged to voluntarily carbon reductions, and they've touted it up. And the amount of carbon reductions that these corporations will make is equivalent to the entire CO2 emissions of Indonesia, 3% of, of global emissions. That's significant. So what I'm saying is that, um, is that uh, our economic system shouldn't be tossed to one side and said it's an environmental uh, problem and we have to deal with, with, with just the environment uh, and, and stop the economy from growing. But we have to think of ways of how we grow and how we innovate and what type of quality of life we want and what types of goods and services we want. And if we treat nature as part of that equation, as part of the wealth on which we, we, uh, we depend on for our well-being and for our, the future generations, then suddenly it becomes part of the good and the services that we want to have. And then it becomes part of what, what the economy as, as, a, as a whole is producing and therefore it's part of our growth and development. And so that's, uh, that's the alternative to saying it's either growth or no growth, which I think is incredibly narrow 
and I think a uh, very um, um, un, uninspiring way to look at the, and depressing way to look at the current and the future. So it's how we change, how we develop, and where, what's nature's role in that and, our, and it is what matters most. And I think that's been a major development in the last 30 years. Uh, and and um, we have, in my opinion, uh, to keep pushing that and, uh, to, because things are changing very quickly. Um, I would just add to that, to, and linking to the previous comment, there's a lot of, um, uh, so, so in my field in, in animal health, um, certainly science has shown that you rarely change the opinions of the people of probably decision making age, but you always change the next generation. So in terms of making huge advancements with respect to say use of animals or whatever, you start with kids. The same is shown in sustainability. Um, sustainability education young uh, will uh, result in policy actions that, that really almost can't be done within the generation that's currently making policy. So I, I just think that this really ties into the education argument as well too, um, and the importance of getting that um, adopted really early. It's really a, a culture, um, and and that starts with young, with youth. So I think that's a that ties into the education argument and the importance of establishing early education in these really important areas. Well, there's a lot to unpack in your question. Um, so, uh, but let me let me give it a shot. I think first off, it it is a lot about how we grow, right? So what are we growing? What are the technologies behind it? And what are the impacts of that growth? And what kinds of things are we, we purchasing? Um, I'm, I'm not sounding like the business guy, I guess, but I'm really concerned about the effects of advertising, right? Because I think economic, the economic system is sort of meant to, you know, in a sort of theoretical perspective, the economic system is supposed to deliver utility, right? or satisfaction, or maybe if you really want to get out there in the crazy world, say happiness, right? But what happens is if it, with advertising, you begin to change people's values, right? So not only are, people aren't just buying what is sort of some um, uh, neutral understanding of their own satisfactions and utilities, you begin to influence what people buy. And so, people's values over time, I think, change into what's advertised them as being good, and therefore they're consuming all these things that you can sell. And some things are more s difficult to sell. I love, kindness, you know, whatever it might be. N nevertheless, uh, the linkage between GDP is just, it's just a terrible measure. I mean, we constantly measure GDP as a success of our society. And oh my God, it's like running a, it's like you're trying to run a business just based off its income statement without looking at the balance sheet. I mean, you can destroy your assets and increase your income, um, and you've accomplished nothing. I mean, take, you know, what will happen after these hurricanes in Texas and Florida and the Keys, and the economy will probably go back up, but they're just fixing what was damaged, right? So GDP might look pretty darn good in some of these areas because there's a lot of economic activity, but the net result is very little marginal marginal good. So um, GDP is a really bad measure. If we, but if we look at GDP, the relationship between GDP and satisfaction with life scores, or maybe happiness, which this stuff is all like really hard to measure anyway. But if you look at the measures people use and you correlate it by country, GDP to satisfaction with life or happiness, um, there's a strong positive correlation but what happens is that positive relationship is attenuated at higher levels of income. So really what it says is low GDP results in unhappiness and low satisfaction. But after a certain point, higher levels of GDP do not necessarily equate with higher levels of satisfaction. So the curve kind of goes like, like this. So um, you know, how much more do we really need? Um, and now I'm, I'm just tempted to get into the whole, the whole world of, of, of inequality across the globe, which is, a whole, which, which is just phenomenal. I think the last figures, and maybe, maybe Ed has this on the top of his head, but uh, something like 1% of the people own 40% of the assets in the world. 70%. 70%. There you go. Um, just, that's absolutely stunning. Um, and so... I saw uh, somebody did a video or a TED talk or something, and 
uh, interview on NPR, I forget where I saw it, but the pitchforks are coming, right? So in addition to all the environmental challenges, um, it's like the French Re Revolution. I mean, sooner or later, people at the bottom get really upset. And, and then they, we end up in political environments like we currently are in, where the two, the two primary candidates were at extremes, actually, in my mind, for a similar reason, a level of dissatisfaction with the current state of things and their income and wealth relative to, to others. So, okay. I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> uh, somebody else can talk or for, answer. Uh, one, let's do two more questions. Hi, thank you all for your comments. My name is Stephanie Enlo. I'm a PhD student from uh, Cornell University in Development Sociology. This question is primarily for Dr. Barbier, but I would be interested in hearing other people's thoughts as well. Um, Dr. Barbier, I think you correctly pointed out that um, this notion or this dichotomy, this false dichotomy that we've set, which is a very Eurocentric and American way of thinking of economy, environment, or I would express it more as um, the disembedding in our minds of social from ecological. Mm. I think this is a really good, um, a good point to make. But I want to push back a little bit or, or more deeply interrogate this idea that global institutions um, or international institutions can be this powerful guiding force to help so-called developing countries or countries in the global south. Um, to manage the changes that are happening in their societies and economies in a way that is more sustainable or more um, friendly to uh, the preservation of biodiversity. And the reason I want to push back against that is thinking historically about international institutions. Think about IMF World Bank um, and the role that they played in Africa during the structural adjustment period and absolute, absolutely catastrophic impacts of those inter international institutions um, and how um, American power played a role in shaping those institutions, and then thinking more into the present, think about NATO as some kind of international governance structure, and how NATO encourages, or basically forces Mexico to accept cheap corn from my home state, Iowa, um, grown in a way that is extremely detrimental to biodiversity, therefore disenfranchising or dislocating smallholder farmers in Mexico. Um, and often smallholder farming is more biodiverse or more supportive of more complex um, type of agro-ecosystem than certainly the type of agro-ecosystem that we've been building in Iowa. Um, and so given that international institutions, governance structures, et cetera, have been shaped so powerfully by very Eurocentric ways of thinking, ways of doing, um, regarding the environment, <laughs> regarding the economy, what society should look like. Um, I guess my question is, what are the opportunities that you see to bring more types of voices to the table if we're going to somehow create some kind of in international institution to help um, govern the way or think about the way that we uh, support biodiversity going forward? Uh. Big question. Um, first of all, I, I think you made a, a little bit of a mistake there. NATO is the no North Atlantic Treaty Organization, so NAFTA. And NAFTA is not an international organization. It's a treaty. It's an agreement. And, and so, not really, but that's all right. Um, uh, there's, it's a, uh, but no, nonetheless, let's, let's go, go to international institutions that, that we have created, such, such as the World Bank, IMF, and the United Nations system which, by the way, are all part of the same system. Um, you can always look at the things that go wrong and the things that are bad that's happened to these, but there's been also a lot of good that's been created uh, by these institutions. So, uh, for example, we wouldn't have the Paris Climate Change Agreement if it wasn't for the UN um, Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is part of that institutional structure. Um, the, there's the Global Environmental Facility, there's uh, the Biodiversity Convention, all of which are managed by the system. My, 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 I actually agree with you. The problem is, is the fact is that we haven't handled the biodiversity, global biodiversity problem very well at the international level, and our institutions aren't working well to do that. Uh, and that's what I was actually saying, is that we, we need some... Uh, uh, I think the Convention on Biological Diversity, which was part of the uh, 1992 UN um, uh, first sustainable development conference, conference or environment and development conference in, in Rio, um, that that uh, 
uh, convention was kind of modeled on the old style of convention. Let's just have everybody in the country agree and have targets. I think we can't do that anymore. We don't have the time and we don't have um, uh, the, the, the ability to agree across countries. The other thing we need to do is have something created internationally that would be a funding mechanism that would allow richer countries and the international community as a whole to fund the incredible costs that developing countries are going to have to incur to conserve biodiversity. We don't have that mechanism yet, uh, and, and we, we should, and it's not difficult to do, but it will take a great deal of, of effort to do that. Um, and in general, I think that uh, what we need, first of all, is to recognize that um, biodiversity is, is valuable. Uh, that it is incredibly important that we conserve biodiversity in diverse habitats uh, and ecosystems, and that we work out uh, most efficient and, and long-lasting survival ways of doing it. Uh, I'm not sure governments and international institutions are the only things that matter in this. I think that uh, uh, local entities, local people, uh, and communities, uh, and regional and subnational units have to be heavily involved and. Uh, there's a lot of initiatives to try and, and focus on this. There's a huge now international non-governmental apparatus that is trying to work at that level uh, and succeeding in some cases and also having spectacular failures. Um, so uh, we need to learn from that as well. Um, but what I do know is that I'm, I'm very worried about the time frame. I think we're on a course right now that in the next, if we don't start doing something more um, significantly improved approaches in the next 10 or 15 years, we may be in serious trouble to, to start this process. All right, I'm, I'm going to stop it there because it's 1030, so please join me in thanking our, our panelists for answering your excellent questions. <laughs>